Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. Just not always the same ones. I'm Steve Aiken. Here. <laughs> like some, Are some, you though? Well, sometimes Are we you? do title. Sometimes we do titles. Sometimes we don't, and it feels right, weird so you... to, to to not do the title. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we, you're Steve Aiken. You're from Fine Gardening Magazine. I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm from Fine Gardening Magazine. We're here to talk about plants today. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> now that now that that's out of the way, let's move quickly on. <laughs> well, okay. So today's topic, we're getting a little amped up because we got our 160 degree uh, day the other the other week, last week, I guess, here in the Northeast. And, you know, and, like, and, all, and, and it's going to snow tomorrow. So and it's going to snow tomorrow. And it actually snowed last night. So, you know, we're, we're in this vortex now of where, you know, hey, if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute. That's, you know, old Mark Twain. But the 60 degree weather got us amped up for spring. So today's topic is underappreciated plants for spring, which Steve thought was an entirely different topic today. What did you think it was? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything I've got still works, so don't worry. All right, great. <laughs> well, that's awesome. All right, well, um, so Steve, is there, is there, uh, are these all plants from your garden? Are these a mix of plants not from your garden and from your garden? What do you got going uh, well, on? Well, one is from my old garden that um, I miss every spring. I miss. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid to plant it again because I, I, I think I'll uh, kill it. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. That's not my first plant. Okay. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm too lazy to scroll up in my notes. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, got, I have a mix, too. I have I have a couple of things that, you know, I really wanted to talk about. And then um, I, I went into a photo shoot that I had done a few years ago in spring and found something. Well, that's coming up. That actually is my first plant and found something that I was like, I can't believe I haven't planted. So that was exciting for me, um, finding new plants to add to my ever growing list. But uh, I'm going to I'm going to kick it over to you first because I need a little more coffee before I, I launch into my first plant. So what do you got going on for plant number one? Well, you know, uh, underappreciated. Uh, I don't know if that's the I would say disrespected um, mainly by me. Uh, is this entire genus of plants um, uh, known as Wygelas. Mm. Um, I don't I don't have a lot of love for them, and I don't know why, because in spring, when they're in flower, they're gorgeous. Um, mm. And I say, oh, wow, what is that? Look at that. Oh, that, that plant's so gorgeous. I have to grow that. And like, oh, it's a Wygela. Oh, no. <laughs> There's just something I don't like about their stems. And I, I've been I've been thinking for the past forty eight hours, like what is it about their their branches that I just don't like? They're sort of like weird tentacly, like they have some sort of weird texture to them. There's mm. just something about it, and it's like a it's like an odd gray beige, um, you know. Anyway, uh, the the but I I do have a couple in my garden, um, and there's one that I love every spring, and I I don't appreciate this plant enough. Um, it's it, it, it spring show is so impressive that um, I'm okay with it for the rest of the year being kind of meh. Yeah. Um, and it, the, the one I have is golden jackpot. Um, mm. It's uh, it's Latin name is uh, Wygela Florida Monrigny. Um, okay. Which, which is good because it's not a, a unpronounceable, you know, series of numbers and letters. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, it's Hardy and zones four to eight. Um, it's supposedly a full sun to partial shade plant. We'll get to that. Um, so it's a shrub about four to six feet wide and it has golden yellow chartreuse leaves, um, that, um, they don't, they don't fade to green. Um, but that's, uh, that's a different season in spring. You have this, these yellow, like healthy yellow, um, leaves with, um, these, 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 uh, it's just covered in flowers, uh, that are red and they kind of, they fade to pink, you know, and they last for, for a good long time. It puts on a nice show because it's a big bulky shrub covered in blooms, golden foliage, red flowers. Oh yes, this is amazing. Um, so spring is just wonderful with this, uh, with this shrub. Um, but I, I find it does, it doesn't really like summer because hmm. after the blooms fade, the foliage gets to be a little burny. 
And I have this. It does not get full sun. It's on the east side of my house. So the house blocks it for um, at least the second half of the day. And it's got a, it's like two feet from a giant magnolia, which blocks out the sun for a good. Um, and so it gets morning sun, you know, maybe up until like noon, one o'clock. So it's not too much sun. Yet the foliage will, will burn on it. Mm-hmm. It, 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 will, it will bleach out, you know. Um, and then I don't know what happens. Do, do Wigellas sort of lose their foliage or something? Because, you know, uh, late summer into fall, that's when I start noticing those stems that I just don't like. And the whole thing just feels kind of gangly and weird. And I'm like, oh, you're, you're, you're not really a good shrub, are you? And then hmm. spring comes around again. I'm like, oh, no, I love you. Forget that I ever said anything bad about you. Um, you're great. Um, I should grow more of you. Um, but I just love golden jackpot in the spring. And so I think it's under the, the, the plant is underappreciated, at least by me. Um, okay. And I, I think I think Wigellas get a, kind of a bad rap because I've never heard anybody like go on and on about how much they love Wigellas, Wigellas, however you say it. Um, but when they're in flower, man, I, I've fallen in love a bunch of times with Wigellas when they're in flower. And, you know, my mother has one uh, Java red, which has a deep maroon mm-hmm. foliage to it all throughout the year. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's a that's a good shrub. Oh, yeah, maybe that's the good one. And then I'll look at it in other times and be like, nah, it's got those weird, I don't know. I don't know. For some reason, the tentacles always comes to mind with those stems. And I don't know what it is about it. Um, And and now I'm going to be obsessed with it and I'm going to be staring at it for the rest of the year. What is it about these stems that I don't like? But forget about the parts that we don't like. We're talking about spring. And if you want something that shines in spring, golden jackpot. Wygela with its golden foliage, bright red flowers, uh, which is a wonderful combination. Um, it's it's going to steal your heart. It's um it the way that you described it almost sounded like foliage wise, it was a m- miniature version of Sun King Aurelia. You know, like you said that it's like that goldeny color, and then it fi- kind of fades to like a sh- more of a chartreuse, it, and it, it, it but it doesn't fade. It, it, okay. it, bleaches, it bleaches out, um, you know, um, it, it, it's the, it's, it's claim to fame is that it doesn't fade, Ooh. but it bleaches. Like, you know, they don't put that on the plant tag. Like, oh, it doesn't fade <laughs> to green. Well, I, I would think because of how you described it, and I don't know if you went into the shape of the flowers, but I'm assuming it's got that same kind of tubular shape to yeah. its flowers that most yeah. Wygelias do. Well, so it must attract like those early hummingbirds, I would think, red tubular flowers earlier in spring yeah um it, i would be surprised if it did not but uh that doesn't mean i've seen any on there but, um, <laughs> all right you know well, hum, hum, hummingbirds are fast and i'm slow you know? okay all right well i would so, i would think that it would be a good candidate for that i kind of feel similarly about wygelias and i don't know why that is i think the only one or two that i have uh we got as sample plants and i <laughs> And I didn't like them so much that I threw them out by the mailbox, which for me is like a mile down our driveway. So, so it's in Siberia. It's, it's, as far. It, 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 is it my Monet? I believe it is. It's the variegated yeah. leaf. And then it's got yeah. kind of a soft pink flower. And we know how I feel about pink anyway. So yeah, yeah it's got a soft pink flower, which is ironic because I'm about to talk about a shrub that has a pink flower that I do like. But um, yeah, I think it was my Monet. I threw it by the mailbox and it never fails that I have a neighbor every couple of years ask me, what is that amazing shrub? I'm like, seriously, well, you if should, you want it, dig it up. <laughs> yeah, you should give it to him. No, I, I have I have my Monet too. Um, and it, uh, to me, it's just too variegated. There's a mm-hmm. regular, var- like uh, Wygella Florida variegata, mm. which is a really attractive uh, plant. Uh, but t- for me, my Monet is just too variegated. It has, it's like white, cream, pink, green, and maroon. Like it's, there's like just a little too much color in it for me. Um, it's a, it's it, very, it, it's like a confectionery. It's very <laughs> confectionery. Well, how, just uh, to, to, to digress into my Monet, how tall is yours? Uh, let's see. How tall is a, is a standard like mailbox post? Is I don't know, like two, two, three feet. Yeah. That's about how tall it is. Cause oh. I have to whack it back a little bit to, uh, to be able to it not envelop the mailbox. So the mail lady doesn't get mad at me. Oh, that's that's funny because mine mine is on the side of our driveway. It does not get a lot of sun. It's it's under a foot. 
and has oh. always been under under a foot for years. But oh, it's wow. tough. It's tough. It's in it's in a it's in a rough spot. Um, and um, it's doing just fine, other than growing too short. You know, huh. like it's it, it's doing fine. I don't like you know I don't like it, but it's you know. It's I mean, okay. it might be a candidate. It, it might be a candidate for you to, you know, transplant it and throw it up by your roadside because, yeah, that's where I have it. The thing gets nailed by the snow plow every year. I mean, it just you can't kill it. it Wygelias probably should go on that bomb proof list of shrubs because they're but, they're tough. And, and so, just to finish up with 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 Wygelas, um, do do you know anybody who's in love with these plants? It's or everyone just kind of like, eh. You know, or I have well, this one, you know, I know that I have former coworkers who are going to laugh at this. Um, I, I used to work at a nursery a long time ago and the owner of the nursery used to call them Wiglias and he loved them. Um, it was okay. an older gentleman. I, I'm actually not sure if he's still with us, but um, older gentleman, and he used to call them Wiglias, and he loved them. That is the only person I've ever known <laughs> to like Wigelia. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I have a shrub too as my first one. I'm I'm pretty shocked that you came in with a shrub. You you are you are usually not a shrub guy that you throw in shrubs here, but um. Yeah. I came in with a shrub and uh, I was talking about it at the top of the show. So it was, I went into an old photo shoot to look to see, hey, you know, what was I really jazzed about? What is underappreciated for spring? And I went into a photo shoot from Blythewald Mansion and Gardens, which is in Bristol, Rhode Island. It's a public garden. And I think that we talked about this on uh, last show because you were mentioning the dove tree that you fell in love with there at this public garden. Well, so this was a shrub that I took just a ridiculous amount of photos of. And I really sh- like got obsessed clearly with it because there's 20 photos of the same exact photo. Um, and it was Chinese Nelia or Nelia. Um, help me out, Steve. It's N-E-I-L-L-I-A. Uh, I believe that's Nylia. Nylia. That's what I wrote down. And that's what the, like I had translated from our, from online pronunciation. So it's Chinese no, Nylia. We- we're saying right now the p- correct pronunciation of that is Nylia. Nylia. We, ha- we have declared it a fact. We have. We have. Mark it down. It is, it is, it is now a thing. Nylia <laughs> is how that is said. All other pronunciations are wrong. Wrong. That is right. I like it. Um, so it's Nylia sinensis, and this is zones five to seven. And, uh, you know, I dug in a little bit for the research because it was beautiful when I saw it. It had a kind of a vase like shape to it. It's us- it usually gets about five feet tall and wide, but it has more of this almost colquitzia beauty bush shape to it. And you can see the the bare stems, quote unquote, but the bare stems are beautiful. They're kind of a silvery color to them. And then it gets these really, really, really serrated teardrops shaped leaves that, so you've kind of got this sawtooth edge to the leaf to it. So that's cool because it's kind of got some texture, but the young branches, because this is a whackable, you've cut this all the way back to the ground yearly. The new branches of it are bright red. So you've kind of got that coolness going on. Um, But that's not the main show. The main show is spring. And this thing puts on chains of pink flowers, pinky coral color. I know we're taping, but not everybody watches this on YouTube. So uh, Steve is wearing the color of the flowers today. (laughs) It's kind of a corally, pinky kind of color he swears it's orange it's not orange um so So that's this is is a faded orange (laughs) on camera it looks pinkish but the flowers um to to describe the shape think of a hops you know hops and beer bract and then Mm -hmm. kind of pull it out make it elongated so it looks like these elongated pink hops like bracts and they hang on from mid spring all the way through into midsummer and they eventually kind of bleach out a little bit until white but 
super cool plant. It's a suckering plant, but it's not an obnoxious suckering plant. Um, so it's easy. It's, you know, people hear suckering plant and they're like, oh, there goes an acre. But it's not, it's not like that. You'll get some multi stem suckers that it will come out from the base of it and kind of make a bit of a thicket, but we're not talking an acre worth of land that you need. So Chinese Nylia, it, and I just, uh, I wrote it down. I wrote it on my plant list to get this year because also the thing I, I, I think I failed to mention is that this thing does well in partial shade, which I kind of appreciate. Um, that can be a tough spot for me. I have a transition to woodland to my garden area. And I think that this would be a good contender for over there. And plus, I feel like there's so many like, you know, like your Wygelia, like Forsythia, like Dutzia. There's so many spring flowering shrubs that don't have much going on after they yeah. flower. And this thing's got cool bark, cool leaves, cool stems. So to me, that kind of makes up for, all right, you know, you're a spring flowering shrub, but you got something going on the rest of the year. So yeah, that's Chinese Nylia. That's zones five to seven and it's Nylia sinensis. Um obviously an Asian cultivar. Yeah. It's, um, I've never heard of this plant and I have no idea what it looks like other, other than what you, what you said. So I, it makes me wonder a, why have I never heard of it? Or B, is it just, is it like new to the, to the market, like within the last 10 years or so? I don't uh, think so. I don't, I, I really don't think so. I like when I, when I plugged it into the Google machine, you know, to do a little research, you see it everywhere, but I think it's just not, you know, it's, it's underappreciated. It's one uh, of those yeah. plants that just doesn't get the love. Maybe, because that's not a great name, Chinese Nylia. I mean, it sounds like one of those like Nyla bones that dogs chew on. I mean, no. it doesn't. It doesn't really have a catchy name. It's not, you know. It's I, no. I think I think Nylia is a wonderful name. It's like it's like the wonderful. It's like a wonderful um, name from another country. Oh, like oh, and this is this is my daughter Nylia. Like, oh, oh, what a wonderful name! Like that right. kind of thing. Okay, you know? all right. But, yeah. but when you, when you put Chinese in front of it, they're kind of like, oh, are you? You know, it makes it sound like you're uh, uh, qualifying it, and uh, and also uh, it right right away says it's not native, so that turns yes. A lot of people all so maybe off. that yeah, uh, so maybe that's why it hasn't caught on. But it is a it's a worthy shrub, um, and supposedly from from research, also extremely tough. So there you go. That's that's perfect. Yeah. All right. So let's. It's probably a good idea to translate uh, translate. So it's probably a good idea to transition to a native because uh, I have a wonderful. Oh uh, yes, yes, let's yeah. do that because I uh, do too. I do too. Okay, uh, <laughs> the 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 native I want to talk about is something I I had in my previous garden and I have not transferred it to my own and I feel sad every spring because I miss it because it's such a wonderful plant. And it's called twin leaf. Uh, oh. Je- yeah, Jeff Jeffersonia uh, diphylla, mm-hmm. uh, and it's hardy from zones five to seven. And it needs uh, moist soil in partial to full shade. And it's called twin leaf because, you know, it gets, it gets you know, maybe over a foot tall, but it has these two uh, deeply lobed um, leaves. They're ca- sort of like oddly kidney shaped leaves mm-hmm. that, come the, that come off the stem. And it turns out that they're one leaf. It's just one leaf, but they're so heavily lobed. It looks like there's two of them. I always thought there were two of them and I was just looking up the hardiness zones and I read that it's actually one leaf. I'm like, Oh, now I got to look at it again. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's just, it's just such a wonderful, the, the leaves in itself are just so charming because it's like, they're like little twins. And it's like, Oh, Oh, isn't that a, a cutie pie? Um, and, and that to me is the reason that um, I fell in love with it. It does have flowers in the spring, like little white um, flowers that are sort of like, um, I don't know. What's the botanical description when you have petals with spaces in between? You know, it's like a kid's drawing of a flower. You yeah. know, there's like, there's, I think there's like six or eight petals uh, on Sorry. it and they're, they're spaced out, something like that. <clears throat> um, and they, they don't last long. Um, they're always, they seem to be in the process of opening or fading. You know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, I don't think I've ever seen it fully open, but it's the, the leaves are just so delightful. And it's, um, it to me says spring, like, look, okay, we're opening, you know, everybody's back in business. It's time. And it's, there's something about this plant in the woodland that just makes it seem like it goes there, you know, and it's happy. There's, you know, um, and I had, like I said, I had this in my old yard and I just discovered it. I did not plant it. Um, it was, uh, out in back underneath some deciduous trees, uh, you know, on the, the, the woodland edge with, with some trout lily 
um, as well. And that's, this is how I, this is how I came to know these two plants. I'm like, oh my. Um, and I, I have to think that they were planted there by some discerning gardener, not the people who owned the house before me, because no, it wasn't them, uh, but probably <laughs> maybe, maybe a person before them. Uh, because this twin leaf, while, while being native, it's native to the Midwest, like Western New York, over to like mm-hmm. the Great Plains, you know, and then like, uh, you know, south into, you know, some, I think I, I said Maryland or something, but sort of, you know, the, the Midwest, you know, hunk of the hunk of the country, um, which is mid, but really not West. But I digress. Uh, but it's just it's such a it's such a it's a spring delight. It's absolute spring delight. But it needs the the um, the soil to, the soil to stay evenly moist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and where where it was in my garden was uh, you know uh, it sloped down to a little stream, and yeah. and under deciduous trees with all the with all the leaves and the the forest duff and whatnot. Uh, I never watered it or anything or, you know. Um, and I think it tends like if it doesn't get um, stay watered, it will go summer dormant. Um, mm-hmm. But just a just a oh. it's just a charming little plant. It just it just says woodland and spring to me. You know, it makes me happy every time I see it, and that's that's kind of what I want out of a plant. Absolutely. So, is it a true ephemeral? I mean, does it does it eventually go away no matter what the moisture level? Oh, gosh, I would have to. There's some native plant ex- expert out there who knows more than I do. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I did, Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to put you on blast. <laughs> I, you know, well, my my sense was that it's, it's ephemeral only because it didn't get water. Like, like if had I watered it throughout okay. the summer, it would, it would have hung around. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, you know, it's like, if it, if it's not, it's like those guys at the flea market, you know, when the traffic, you know, kind of dies down, they pack up their stuff and go, even though the flea market is still going on, you know, <laughs> you, but you, 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 but I mean... you, you, you know what I mean? You know? I do. Like, all right. All right, this ain't yeah. this ain't happening. We're we're packing it Pack in it for in. the year. Yeah, 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 we'll, yeah. We'll, be, we'll be back next year when when the moisture is plentiful. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I do love this this flower. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen it this this perennial, this per, perhaps per, ephemeral. I don't know that I've ever seen it in person. Um, I have seen it in several articles that we've done for fine gardening. It seems like it makes the list of really cool, underappreciated perennials, spring flowering, but you don't know it list a lot with really, really uh, well-versed plants people. Like I'm thinking Dave Demers, I think had it in his article, maybe, um, oh gosh, I feel like maybe Bill Kalina had featured it in one of his articles way back, but uh, that bodes well because you've got two pretty heavy hitting plants people who really dig it. The thing about this is when you see it, you'll recognize it because twin Mm -hmm. leaf, like, yeah, it looks like it has these two leaves that are exactly the same that are just like, um, like, like butterfly wings, they've just they've just opened, um, and you you look at it, you say, oh, twin leaf, and you'll be so excited, and like that's that's the whole vibe of this plant. Oh, twin leaf, that's so is. awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, hey. let's move let's move from your oh, former woodland wetland area in your garden to my current woodland wetland area of my garden because I have a northeast native too that likes similar conditions, and. I know everybody's going to roll your eyes at this, but I'm going to feature Eastern skunk cabbage, which is, um, oh, geez, here we go. Similocarpus fetidus, which is zones four to seven. Um, So Eastern skunk cabbage. Yes, it does smell, but not like a skunk all the time, every time that you get near it. Um, it is a plant that right about now, um, we are we are actually taping this here. We're going to take you behind the scenes, oh, valued listener. We tape this a little in advance. So right about now, which is towards the end of March, it emerges from a wetland area with this really, really cool hooded burgundy spotted with chartreuse spathe. So kind of this hooded little protrusion through the leaf litter 
And in the middle of that, it's got a little um, spadex, they call it, which is this little itty bitty flower that's covered in pale yellow and kind of purple flowers in it. So it looks like this alien thing emerging through the leaf litter in kind of moist areas. It's so cool. I walk around the edge of my garden. I walk around the edge of my property and it makes me so happy. It is literally screw the robins. I mean, it is the harbinger of spring. It really is. I'm like, oh my God, oh my gosh, spring. It it actually is coming. So I had to look into this because it seems like I see that before anything else, any other signs of life in the woodland. And I was like, that's really strange. Well, so it turns out, did you know this, Steve, that this is one of only a few plants that is thermogenic so oh, it per- <laughs> oh my, my knowledge of thermogenic plants is just is just unrivaled. So, <laughs> of, so of course I knew whatever it is you're going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So the eastern skunk cabbage is thermogenic. So it produces its own heat. It produces its own heat source. And so the reason that you see it is because it does emerge before most other things. And the reason that you see it popping up sometimes through the snow is because it melts all the snow around it. And the reason that it does this is that it's able to carry its odor from that flower farther at to a farther distance to attract pollinators, early pollinators that need it as a, a food source. Um, so how cool is that? I just think that's the coolest thing. You don't smell it. it. It's not that odor is very, very slight. So, all right. So eventually this weird thermogenic flower thing goes away um, and it's replaced by these large one to two foot long fleshy green leaves that Under any other circumstances, if they were sold, you know, by by a tropical plant nursery, people would go bananas over it because they really do. They look like short little banana plants and they're amazing for texture. Um, Those last generally in through um, summer. Then when things dry out, get really, really hot, uh, this guy disappears completely. Um, So it's gone. Um, The only time that I have ever smelled the skunky smell is when we were kids, we used to snap off the leaves and try and whip each other with it. So you would, you know, make the other kids smell like a skunk going home to mom. That's the only time that I've ever smelled the skunkiness that everybody talks about. So, you know, skunk cabbage is a a bit of a misnomer. Like it's not going to smell like a skunk in your garden. Um, I don't think I mentioned it's zones four to seven. It's native to the upper Midwest and into the Northeast. So up and down the Northeast and obviously partial shade to full shade because it is in a woodland area and it likes that, that muddy or a wet area. This would be a really good candidate for a rain garden situation but um so so cool so so interesting totally underappreciated i know i've mentioned white skunk cabbage um in previous episode a long time ago but that's a completely different genus and species and it's from russia so this is this is a completely different animal so not to be confused so eastern skunk cabbage uh cephalocarpus Betitus. Yeah. This it. is this is probably a good time to, to to mention your your new podcast that you're developing. It's called it's called Childhood Fun with Danielle Sherry. Uh, so, yeah, it's um the first episode is is devoted to to various um, things to whip other children with to make, to make them stink. Um, we used to do that as kids. I don't know. I mean, I grew I, up rurally. There wasn't a well, whole lot I, to I, do. I think the the stigma with this plant really comes from its name because you have skunk mm-hmm. and cabbage. These are two things that are not uh, no one considers really, you know, all that um, appealing sounding. Uh, yes. So per- perhaps we should change its name to like aroma lettuce or something like that, and then it would get it would get it would get a little more love because yeah, like I have the same feeling in spring like oh skunk cabbage is out, yeah, you know? but Hooray. like like oh oh look at the aroma lettuce like wouldn't that be <laughs> Oh, the forest floor was covered with aroma lettuce, you know, as opposed to skunk cabbage, you know, like it's the it's the kind of cabbage that is so bad that even people won't eat it, you know. <laughs> I really think that skunk cabbage needs to hire you as its new PR person. I'm available. All right, Steve. So is your next plant something that you used to torture children in your childhood with? 
No, uh, alas. Um, and it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's also not uh, thermogenic. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know. Like next next episode, I can present you with a whole uh, host of of thermogenic plants. Um, All right, but but Please this one do. is just yeah. I'm just going to stick to the non thermogenic just for for. Um, but you know, um, springtime wonders. Um, I have to go with Allium moly janine, uh, mm. which is which is an allium, but it's a yellow allium. It's a golden allium. Um, it's a little like if you're thinking of the big, tall pom pom uh, ornamental alliums, it's not that it's shorter and the flower is more of an open uh, umble. So it's 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 not it's like a loose ball as opposed to like the, the, the big round balls of like gladiator or something like that. But it's just it's this wonderful bright yellow. Um, and then if you look at the little florets that make up the, the umble, um, they have a little um, they have a little green stripe on them. And it's just these, so these wonderful little yellow stars that I think you get two stems per, per bulb. So you plant a whole bunch of bulbs in, in a mass um, and it looks great. So it's something about yellow in spring. Yeah. I don't know why. It's just, it's just so magical. So um, Janine is, is about 12 to 18 inches tall. Um, and I think it slowly uh, spreads. Um, foliage is, you know, it's like the, the strappy, you know, two inch wide. Uh, foliage, but it's really the flowers in spring that, um, ha- you know, w- when you have a nice clump of them, it, it really takes your your breath away. Just this, it's it's purely golden, like you know, like a nice um, pure yellow um, gold uh, that that you don't get from from other alliums. Mm-hmm. I think I think that's the only yellow alley. It's the only yellow one I know of, um, and it's this is a tough plant because. Um, regular listeners to the show will know how I treat my plants um, and have heard the story of me uh, obtaining a plant early in the year and then uh, sort of letting it sit in its container for most of the year. Um, Multiple that, years. Yeah. Well, this is, this is one that had that treatment. Um, hmm. Let's, let's call it like a Steve stratification. Um, it, has, ah. it, has to, it has to go through a process before you know, I add it to my. Of so, severe neglect. Well, I, you know, we had it at the, at the, at the late great uh, fine gardening plant sale. Um, and there was one left over and I'm like, oh, oh, all right. This is supposed to be a good one. I'll, I'll bring her home, uh, brought her home. And there she sat. Uh, and then um, a year went by and, and spring comes around. And I said, I looked at, uh, it was before anything had popped up. And I said, what's this black pot here um th- was there something that i forgot to plant uh, could it be um and then the plant tag said alia moly i'm like oh this one's a goner uh, i'll just i'll have to i'll have to use that dirt for something else or something and so so i left it and then uh lo and behold you know a few weeks later boom here comes some some growth um out of that pot so i planted it um and she she did just fine and last year because we're now in the spring again, she came right back um, and, and had expanded. I guess the, the bulb produced more bulblets oh, underground or, or something like that, um, <laughs> because I didn't count how many bulbs were, were in the soil um, that I planted. And um, God, I just had this wonderful mass of, of, of yellow um, flowers in spring. It just like, I, you know, I made a point of walking by that part in the garden just so I could see it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, tough, uh, beautiful, short, Deer proof, rabbit proof. Yeah, onion family. Yep. Uh, alas, not native. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where it's native to, but it ain't North America. So um, I, I guess a- like Eurasia, you know. Yeah, I feel like this would be a good alternative because a, a plant that has foiled me for so so long is winter aconite, where oh, yeah. I get those little bulbs that are really. F- stinking expensive every fall it seems i plant them and i might get one or two and then the next year nada um so low growing one golden yellow flowers uh but, 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 it sounds like this allium di- might be better yeah vastly different flowering time so winter aconite yeah. is like the first first thing you get this thing is it's um you know, how, late, yeah late, how late, late, late late spring Okay. You know, all right. That's um, okay. I can wait. I can wait. Yeah. I've got some forsythia in the back 40. That'll give me that early yellow color. But, you know, it seems like this might be like a, a tougher, better alternative for that. Um, and I can stop wasting my money on winter aconite, which clearly is not a good choice for me. 
Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not really good. I guess with seasons, I'm kind of the same way as I am with, with colors. Color. That I don't, I, I don't really know what, what they are. So for me, their early spring is uh, tulips and daffodils that might have some snow around them. That's early <laughs> spring. Okay. And then mid spring is like after that snow has melted um, and there's still no, uh, leaves, leaves on the on tree, the okay. and then at, at whatever point I start wearing short sleeves, that's summer. <laughs> I feel like we need an infographic yeah, that shows yeah, this. Yeah, we do that. So it's like I start wearing short sleeves, and my son starts telling me telling me how many days left of school he has in the year. Okay. that's that's summer. Like when that when that's that countdown starts to happen. You okay, know? all right. O- o- only fifty seven more days, Dad. Well, what are you going to do with your summer? Nothing, you know. (laughs) Well, all right. So I have an allium too, and it wasn't going to be the next one that I was going to do, but I'm just going to piggyback onto your your allium train you got going on here. I'm going to do black garlic, which is allium nigrum, and that's zones three to eight. And I feel like this is an underappreciated allium because, yes, it is a drumstick allium that gets you know the ball of flowers up at the top of that skinny stem but it ain't a purple one and i feel like the purple ones are the ones that get all the love you know the globe master the purple sensation even uh christophi the star of persia that's a purple one too like those are the alliums that everybody sees in every magazine and gets all the love And black garlic is white. So allium nigrum is white. And typically I would be against- Is it it like a Greenland, Iceland thing? They're trying to throw everybody off? I know, right? Right? Isn't that weird? Well, so where the black comes in, I think, this is my speculation based on zero knowledge whatsoever, is that- It's got that white puffy ball, but then in the center, you know, like most alliums, you get those little seeds that are in there and they start out bright green and they eventually fade to purple, like a purpley black color. So it's kind of interesting because you've got this white between a golf ball and a baseball sized flower that's made up of all these teeny tiny little starlet type flowers. And then in the center of each one of those is a seed. It starts out green, so you really can't tell, and then eventually fades into a purpley black color. So you get this white and black kind of mottled thing going on. And they're really beautiful. They're one to two feet tall, so they're not the gigantic ones, um, alliums that you're used to. Um, in so many, you know, I feel like English gardening magazines, every single cover comes out in the spring and it's like these giant purple alliums. Uh, full yeah, sun. They stink. Yeah, I know. Those English, English gardening magazines. <laughs> they do. No, no one should read those. <laughs> They're very inspirational, but I mean, that is just not going to happen at, you know, six ninety nine a bulb. Yeah. Sign me up for 500 on the walkway up to my castle. Um, So full sun, well-drained soil is a must. And I, I, you know, I've been getting really hot to try on alliums lately because I've got, excuse me, such a bad vole problem um, that voles will stay away from the the allium bulbs. Uh, So this is something that you would plant in fall, puts on its big show, usually for us in May. So I would say for most folks, it would be mid-spring. And it's just really, really interesting. I I, I love that it's white. Um, Typically, you know, once we get into prime time, June, July, White flowers don't really do it for me. I think that they wa- they're they washed out in that bright sun. But in spring, you know, it's kind of nice to see that white. It's a, it's, it's, a little, uh, it's a little bright light at the end of winter. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, it sounds like it's about the same size as, as Allium Moly Janine. Um, and, and I've fallen in love with the summer blooming Alliums, which are not part of this. Uh, but... You know, there are so many cool alliums out there that I keep saying I cannot have too many alliums. No. Um, and, and I'm not talking about the big ones. I'm talking about these little guys. 
mm-hmm. um, that that really are, you know can, can do a lot of work. Ali and Moly goes dormant. Does does yours go dormant? Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. and so you know you have to take that into consideration where you plant it. I mean, I always say like an ornamental grass is an allium's best friend, you know, because it puts out that, you know, fleshy foliage that dies as it's flowering. So Mm -hmm. if you've got an ornamental grass around it or a sedge, something like that, that really does kind of take care of the ugliness that's going on. And then it just, you know, I always love that the alliums, once they go by and flower, they're kind of these freeze dried sculptures that just kind of sit in the garden. And it looks so cool coming out of the ornamental grass it almost looks like the allium's part of that ornamental grass so um these seeds do do they sprout do they take hold i've never seen any i wish they would well th- I that's the thing would. i have some of the you know so the bigger alliums it's not there's the really big allium i don't know if that's, that's globe ma- is I that think globe that's, master well are you talking about the one that's like almost like uh, it looks like a Sputnik satellite when the, it's the, dried. The, 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 no, that's Christophia. That's Christophia. This is, this, is, yeah. this is tall, big purple ball. I think that's and, Globe Master. Okay, so that's Globe Master. So then I have Gladiator because I can't okay. afford Globe Master. Like you, <laughs> um, the the walkway to my castle is bereft because I can't <laughs> afford, um, you know, all these alliums. So I, I have the less expensive one, uh, but it has seeds on it. And I'm like, oh, great! And so I shake the little seed head, get the seeds all over. I'm going to have. I have a whole bunch of uh, of alliums now, and and no, never. I don't know if something comes along and eats them, they're, if they're not viable, or what. But uh, no, I've never had the seeds take. You know, which is interesting because these ornamental alliums are the cousins, not too distant cousins, of chives, which will seed anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, um, you let them. Like I think, you know, just you know, just mentioning that they have now sprouted wherever they wherever they are. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, you know, the, I don't know the, what the, that's the, about. The plants that you want more of will never set seed. Absolutely. Or like, you know, yeah. So, Steve, let's break things up a little bit because, you know, we've been going plant, 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 plant back and forth. And so I want to hear what's happening in your garden because, you know what, like it's spring. Spring is kind of trying to spring right now. And uh, what do you got going on in your garden other than maybe skunk cabbage coming up? <laughs> yeah, well, well, not not a lot because it's, you know, we're in that time where like, you know, plants are like, okay, is it okay to come out? Like what's, yeah. you know? And so the, the other day I was walking uh, by my driveway and, I, you know, I stopped short because um, my reticulated iris were up. Um, um, and so like I took, I took, you know, just a, a you know, a, f- a couple little ones. And so, of course I took, you know, hundreds of photos of these, you know, a couple <laughs> of plants. And then the, the other day I, my wife was getting the mail and I made her walk back the long way just so she could walk by the, the, the irises, you know? And so she's walking by and didn't notice them, of course. I said, well, stop. Look to your right. She goes, oh, oh, great. Great. <laughs> like, no, look down. Like, oh, oh, oh that's what you're talking Okay, yeah. No, those are wonderful, honey. It's cold <laughs> out. Can I go inside now? I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so, so, so those are happening. And I also noticed that my, my aquilegia, uh, I, I planted a yellow flowering aquilegia last year, um, you know, and I have never had one return for me, like mm-hmm. any aquilegia. Um, and I saw new growth coming on that. So I was really oh, happy man. about that, but then I'm scared because it's supposed to snow tomorrow. So I, I'm wondering if I should go cover it up or something like that. So right. that's pretty much all, all, all that is happening in my, my garden. That's really cool though. I mean, yeah. to have, to have a, uh, Oh God, I need to get some reticulated iris just to get some color. Yeah. Cause the, the only color I'm getting right now in my garden is, uh, from my purple blooming witch hazel, uh, Hamalis vernalis purpurea, I think it is. I don't know. I think they've changed that a million different times, but, um, so I noticed the other day, I don't know why I did this. I cited that thing kind of all the way on the the back edge of the garden. So you don't really see it unless you're walking around. And I'm sorry, like when it's zero degrees out, I don't want to be walking around, but it's blooming, which is exciting. However, it is, I, this is a plant that I, (laughs) I didn't steal it. I convinced a vendor to give it to me when you and I had been at a trade show. Oh, don't many, make me accessory. I was, I wasn't many, there. I have no many, idea what was going on. Many, many years ago, we were at a trade show in the middle of winter. So I babied this thing through and I it was actually at my old house. We were at our old house. So I planted it in a, in a half whiskey barrel and there it has stayed. 
now to our new house and it has lived in this whiskey barrel for 12 years now maybe longer well much, i know much, much like rapunzel trapped in the tower <laughs> longing for release this poor tree right i mean and it's big too i want to say it's probably seven feet tall at least maybe five to six feet wide it's huge free well, that plant free <laughs> that plant well, I that think plant. it's trying to free itself because over the winter, the ribs of the whiskey barrel literally split open. So this tree is now has this whole exposed root ball. It's a split open whiskey barrel. It is. It's a hot mess right now. And I feel so bad and it's blooming. And I almost feel like it's putting up like it's purple flags of like surrender being like, all right, this is it. I'm a goner after this. So, oh man. And the ground is too frozen. I can't dig it in. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's it's kind of a nightmare situation going on. So I'll, I'll keep you updated on a, 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 if a it makes it. A nightmare situation that you created. You could of have treated this, You could have treated it correctly. <laughs> and this is this is what happens when you try to keep something, you know, from being what it what it needs to be. You know, it's gonna know. burst out. It's gonna burst out. And, I know. Uh, yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm like Sea World with an orca whale. Yes. <laughs> Leave, leave the analogy. Leave the analogies to me, Daniel. <laughs> so the the last plant I want to mention uh, is also not thermogenic. I'm sorry, I didn't know we were doing that this time. Um, Stop harping on my thermogenic. Okay, um, it's it's snowdrop anemone. And have you mentioned this before on the on the podcast, Danielle? Uh, anemone sylvestris. Have you mentioned you know, this before? I think we're like 80 episodes in at this point. I have no idea what I've talked about and haven't. I I, I, I don't think so. I don't I don't think so. It's not ringing a bell. Right. So so uh, for me, anemones, the, the ones that I've grown have been the fall. They're the fall blooming ones, which are the tall ones. And there's a spring, mm-hmm. little spring, teeny tiny bulbs. Uh, yes. But this is like the fall one that, that blooms in the spring. Um, it's an actual perennial. It's not a bulb. Um and so it, it gets to be, it's, it stays, the mound of foliage is under two feet tall. Um, I think it'll spread. Mine's about, it's not even a foot wide. Um, Hardy and zones four to eight. But the, the, the thing we, we care about right now is that in spring, it gets like these wiry flowery stems um, in, in mid spring that have these, these large white, I don't know, disc shaped um, flowers with the little yellow um Fluffy stuff in the center, like the the anthers and all the flowery Fluffy parts. Stuff. Yeah, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I do. So so it's like a white disc with a yellow center, um, and, and it's 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 so wonderfully delicate and springy on these little wavy, um, delicate stems, um, and there's, it's just so charming. And this last spring was my first spring with it, and I'm like, oh, oh I fell in love with it, and like, oh, I have to talk about this. Um, and so, someone told me. Um, to plant these with my daffodils to hide uh, the fading daffodil foliage. So that's why I bought it. Huh. Okay. But when it came around t- time to plant it, I didn't plant them next to my daffodils. I forgot. And and so they're, they're not there. Uh, but the, the foliage is, is like a nice little mound. The, the leaves look like look to me like geranium leaves. They're like heavily lobed. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if palmate is the right word. Uh, but to, to me, they look like um, the, the foliage of like geranium roseanne. Um and a partial shade. Um, I've read that it likes full sun, but I'm not 100% convinced of that. Really? Um, That's shocking. It yeah, looks almost I'm, too delicate to want full sun. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, I'm not exactly sure if it spreads. Um, but, the, you know, the, the flowers after they're done, they come these wonderful fluffy seed heads. Um, mm. and, and to me, it's, it's one of those things that uh, uh, I, I've already started checking. You know, like I'm pulling back the, the 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 leaves that are on the ground to see if to see if I've got anything yet um, this spring on my anemone uh, because it's just again like like all of these plants and we keep uh, we keep talking about the emotions that these plants give us in spring like it's just this joy you know of, of spring to see that these things you know um, are, are coming back and like yeah it's time for gardening again um, and and you know. Um, again, the the white is just so refreshing in springtime. It's it's been it hasn't been that long, but it's been you know super easy to grow. As you know, most of my my plants uh, you know it has suffered the neglect and, and come back. Um, so um, just I can't I can't wait for it to come back this spring. 
It seems like a perfect plant to call darling. Like it's just a darling plant. It just seems yes. like very like refined and, and cute and yeah, just it, it, a darling if the, plant. If, the, if, the, if that were in my vocabulary, I might use it. Yes, but it's not. <laughs> Could it be whimsical? No. No, no, anything not but whimsical. whimsical. Anything it's not, it's, whimsical. It's, it's, it's not whimsical. It's, there's no whimsy <laughs> there with the plant. I, I think I remembered as you were talking where this this plant did enter into like my my world. And it was it was Dave Demers again from that same article that he mentioned um, Jeffersonia uh, for Twin Leaf. He, I think he mentioned this plant as well. Um, maybe a cultivar of it, though. Flora Plano. Um, Could be. It's, that's that's and, a common cultivar name. So. Yep, yep. So I, I think he did. And, and uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, very, very what? beautiful. Uh, sometimes people call it like a, a wind flower or something like that. Well, the, the little bulby ones are called Grecian uh, wind, wind, yeah, Grecian wind, wind flowers. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. This and, one's and got a little more oomph to it. Well, yeah, it, it's it's like size like a regular perennial. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and it look it looks like the fall blooming ones. Mm. Uh, so, what the difference between this and the fall blooming ones is, I don't know. I should I should investigate. Um, I should investigate by going out and buying as many of them as I can find. Uh, I think that's great. That, yeah, that solves all my problems. So, I would like to point out that I'm about to talk about another native, and so this time I've talked about two natives, and you've only talked about one. So, let's mark this down in history because usually you pick on me for not doing enough native plants, but here we go. Here is another native plant <laughs> Danielle, score one. Give me a gold star. Um, let's talk about beach plum. So, that's Prunus uh, maritima. Love it. East Coast native. Love it. Um, this is a coastal East Coast native. So, you know, this this tugs on my heartstrings. It's from the area that I grew up um, here in New England. It is a very important plant in sand dune preservation. So that'll give you an idea of the type of conditions it likes. <laughs> so, so all of you listeners out there who are gardening on a sand dune, and well, saying, why? When will they ever talk about my sand dunes? Why won't they do a whole episode devoted to sand dunes? We well, can't quite so, do that, but here you go. It's your- so here's the thing: uh, um, where it is in my garden, hot, hot, full sun. Remember Hospital Hill that I always talk about with lean, really gravelly, well-drained soil. This plant is it. It does gangbusters in this spot. So this is a shrub zones three to eight. Um, overall, it gets three to five feet tall and wide. Uh, right now, because mine is in such lean soil, it's only about three feet tall by three feet wide. And that's after several years. Um, this plant is, is you will see it mentioned for folks who are looking for plants that thrive on neglect. Um, that's its claim to fame. I believe when I went on to Mobot's website, that's exactly what they highlighted, thrives on neglect. So this is a, a rounded shrub that has uh, it, it looks like it's in the apple family, you know, the edible apple family. It looks like a small squat apple tree that it, has, it is in the prunus. It's well, prunus. it's in the prunus. Yeah. Well, yes, but it, it's, it's, in, it's not an apple, but it looks like a small squat apple tree is in the family, but it has like silvery bark to it has the spurs that you'll notice where, you know, the leaves come out of and the fruit comes out of, um, and that it, in spring, before any of the foliage shows up, it's a wash in white with a little slight blush of pink flowers all over it um, that look like a plum tree flowers, look like an apple tree flowers. Beautiful, huge pollinator magnet um, because this is fairly early that it blooms, um, early-ish spring. So Steve, for you, it wouldn't be when the tulips and the daffodils are poking through the snow, but it'd be the next phase, which I don't remember what that okay, was in the Steve right. world. <laughs> well, what, 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 what would it be in your world? Like, okay, um, this- for, for me, it would be that it's like the end of April, beginning of May. So it's when temperatures are starting to, to you know, consistently be in the 50 degree mark. 
Um, so that's when it's going to bloom. Then it puts on gorgeous, glossy, after the blossoms fall away, it puts on gorgeous, glossy, teardrops shaped leaves, green leaves to it. Um, and the, it gives way, those flowers give way with the foliage to these blackish purple small plums. And they are beloved by wildlife but if you can get to them before the wildlife do they're delicious they um they need to be something that you make into a jam or you add sugar to because they're a little bit on the tart side but beach plum jelly is super famous throughout cape cod nantucket martha's vineyard you know all of those beachy destination places will generally sell beach plum jelly because it's so delicious. But, you know, for more practical reasons, this is a really, really tough shrub that just doesn't get the love because I think it is a native plant that people think about in its native conditions, in its native habitats for its, you know, preservation qualities. But they don't think about, hey, you know, a lot of us have really dry soil, really well-drained dry soil, hot blazing sun that kind of mimic its native conditions. And it does really, really well on, on my hospital hill, which we all know not a whole lot does very well on hospital hill. Um, so yeah, this is, this is beach plum again, zones three to eight. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a winner. It is a winner shrub in my book. Can you, uh, can you discuss its thermogenic qualities? (laughs) Hey, it gives you jelly. It doesn't need to be thermogenic. Yeah, it either needs yeah. to give you jelly or thermogenic. Yeah, one or that, the other. And that, yeah, those those plums are good when you wrap them in skunk cabbage leaves. You know, they make a <laughs> wonderful uh, snack. But um, you know, I, I honestly, I have to admit, I didn't listen to much of what you were saying because I, I was struck by this fear that. Uh, apples, which are malice and prunus, which is like the cherries, that, which is what we're talking about, are, are might not be in the same family. So now I have to go and to go and check. Wait, I'm like, wait, yeah. But so, I, I, so, so uh, it's a good time. It's the it's that time of the show, ladies and gentlemen, where I point out that um, I'm not as well informed as I like to think, and sometimes <laughs> I say things that are not. Uh, uh, I speak from my own experience, and my experience is that um, apples and cherries. Uh, and plums tend to bloom at the same time and kind of look alike, so they're in the same family, but they might not be. Um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go go check on that. Okay, I think you should. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter with his thoughts on spring. The biggest surprise I get from my spring garden is when I see that my plants actually came back, especially after the way I treat some of them. Now, I'm not Steve, whose garden is to plants what Alcatraz Prison was to felons back in the 1940s and 50s. I'm just not one to fuss over plants. So, as spring begins to take its hold on the year, I hover over the dead stems and decaying foliage of last year's growth and ask my plants, Have I taken you for granted? Was the summer harder on you than I thought? And is that why winter was too much for you? But in my heart, I know it's too late for such questions. But usually... If I wait a week or so, my answers come in the form of fresh green growth. I'm elated to know that I did right by my plants last year, if only by doing nothing for them. Then I set off, with a little bounce in my step, for yet another year of fuss-free gardening. But, you know, uh, I think Peter is trying to insult me there with the Alcatraz thing, but the gardens of Alcatraz are gorgeous. They are. I have visited them as well. But you know what? I'm going to back Peter up in this because anytime somebody pokes fun at you, I feel like, hey, I got backup on the team. Woo-hoo! Well, I'm sure I will get backup from our expert. Let's find out who is on Experts Testimony this episode. Hello, this is Bill Kalina. I'm the F. Otto Haas Executive Director at the Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Just starting to really feel like spring here in Philadelphia and the spring bulbs are coming up and just looking out my window, one of my favorites is in bloom now, the little iris Catherine Hodgkin, which is a reticulated iris, a bulb iris that comes up about the same time as crocuses. And it's just one of those plants that if you see it, you'll love it. It's got this most amazing color that's a sort of a powder blue with hints of green, believe it or not, and a little bit of 
bright yellow accent on the fall petals. And uh, it's one of, those, one of those plants that I think for many years was rare and hard to find and passed around by bulb enthusiasts. Uh, originally it was developed in the late 1950s, but thanks to the Dutch bulb growers, we can now buy this in the fall as we can other spring bulbs. And it's definitely worth looking for. You'll love it if you love blue flowers. And who doesn't love blue flowers? The flowers are only stand about four inches tall when they're in bloom, and they're maybe two and a half, three inches across, so they're pretty good size. And they'll, uh, they'll multiply quickly, so within a couple of years, each single bulb will produce several flowers. And so I would recommend planting in drifts of 10 to 25, spacing them three inches or so apart, and you'll have nice patches. It, it does love, it does really well with the same conditions that crocus grow in three to four hours of sun in the springtime and crocus makes good companions for them too any of the colors go really well with Catherine hodgkin uh, so give it a try you're gonna love it one of the most incredible foliage plants i've ever grown has a unfortunately confusing latin nomenclature it's known as disosma or podophyllum Dalevii or Dysosma or Podophyllum vicii. I think the technical, the correct name, as far as I can ascertain, is Dysosma dalevii, one of the Chinese May apples, and it's uh, it really is something out of this world. It comes up in the spring like other May apples, this umbrella that unfurls or opens up to reveal leaves that can be you know eight, ten, even twelve inches across, with the most incredible patterns of maroon and burgundy and olive and green. Each one, each plant is a little bit different and each one is just beautiful. It almost has a sort of a velvety sheen to it uh, when it's emerging in the spring. And smaller plants will have just one leaf per stem. Larger ones will have paired leaves. And where the paired leaves meet the stem, it'll produce a few flowers. The flowers are burgundy colored, a little bit of a fetid smell to them of long, thin petals. Uh, they're, they're pretty flowers, but you don't see them that much because they're underneath the leaves. And uh, they really grow it as a foliage plant. I, I will say it's not an easy plant to get established. It seems to really resent root disturbance. I think it has to get to just the right level in the soil. I, I've lost more than I care to admit transplanting these plants, thinking that after the first summer, oh, they're doing good, they're growing, they're established and then losing them in the first winter. But if you can get it through the first winter, then it's fine, it settles in, and it grows really well. So I don't think it's a cold problem. It really is just a case of, of getting its roots established and getting it to sink. If it's established, it will start putting off offsets off the roots. And, um, and then, so eventually, you'll get a little bit of a patch going. The, each leaf, as I said, can be you know 10 inches across or maybe a little bit more, and they stand when they're fully expanded oh, about a foot off the ground. They do hybridize with some of the other May apples, and there are hybrids available. Uh, I would say the one that I've done myself that is you know, a really vigorous hybrid is uh, a hybrid with a species called Pleanthum or Pleantha, and uh, it's a little bit larger, green leaves, so you get different patterns of maroon and uh, spotting and a little larger size and vigor. And so worth investing in and giving it some attention because in moist soils and dappled shade, there's really nothing more spectacular than this Chinese mayapple. Hellebores are in full flower here in Pennsylvania and I know a lot of other places now too. And uh, hellebores are one of those routines that, that we have to do is to cut the old ratty leaves off either if we can get to them in the wintertime or early in the spring so it doesn't impede the, uh, the new flowers and the new stems coming out in the spring. But there is one species which is listed as either Helleborus tibetanus or tibeticus, uh, sometimes also as Helleborus chinensis, uh, but it's uh, a little harder to find, but it's a deciduous species. So you're not gonna get the evergreen leaves um, but they, you know, there's, so it makes the cleanup easier. And the leaves, when they come out, are a beautiful glaucusy blue color with red veins. And uh, they look like your typical kind of hellebore leaves. The flowers emerge the same way, clustered with the leaves. 
And the ones that I've grown are like a, a dark rose color with deeper veins and a little bit of a white uh, overlay on them too. But uh, uh, very, very pretty. And I like the fact that I don't have to trim them up. So if you don't care about the evergreen part of it, look for this one. Uh, it did well for us in Maine. Uh, it does well, I think, in a lot of places. It goes dormant a little bit earlier in the heat. Uh, so it comes up early and it goes dormant a little bit earlier too. Also in the buttercup family, uh, but one a species that hails from the eastern U.S. is a really unusual delphinium or larkspur, uh, delphinium tricorni or the dwarf larkspur. It's a spring ephemeral. You find it in rich woods, slopes, river bottoms, even roadsides. And it looks, for all intents and purposes, like a miniaturized version of your garden delphinium. It has the same sort of palmately lobed, very uh, deeply incised leaves that, uh, that come up as sort of a clump and, and support a single flowering stem, although older plants can have multiple flowering stems in one, uh, one clump. And the flowers range from sort of a light violet purple to deep violet blue or even royal purple. Uh, often with a little bit of white in the center of the flower. And you can get in one colony, you can get various different color combinations. Uh, it, it, the nice thing about this is that because it's a spring ephemeral and it's a native wildflower, it does, it's not fussy like the garden delphinium. So although in flower it might stand only 14, 16 inches tall, uh, it has that beautiful color that we enjoy with delphiniums and these spikes of, of delphinium-like flowers. But when it starts getting warmer in the summertime, the plants turn yellow and die back and go dormant for the year. They die back to a corm, and if you want to divide the plants, that's the time to do it as they're turning yellow. It, it, it sets seed and will seed itself around a little bit too, but uh, just a charming wildflower for a place that receives ideally you know, two, three hours of morning sun. It could take more sun than that. Uh, and in the springtime, will grow in dappled shade in the woodland too, but moist soils, not particularly acidic soils. I would say one of the most unusual, the coolest wildflowers you're ever gonna find out there uh, is, will be in bloom in a little bit, and that is a plant with an unfortunate common name, swamp pink. It doesn't really tell you much about the plant, but Holonius bellata is this, just an oddity uh, but a beautiful oddity. It's, uh, the, the leaves are semi-evergreen. They turn kind of a bronzy or burgundy color in the wintertime. They look like little miniature yuccas, I would say, like a small yucca type of leaf. And in the, when the soil's warm, they send up these spikes. At first, they start flowering when they're maybe only three or four inches tall, but the stems keep growing up. And it's this dense head of bubblegum pink flowers with sky blue anthers that come out in the middle. So you got this like blue and bubblegum pink combination that really is not something you see much in temperate plants. Uh, so just very, very distinctive. And the flowers will just rise up on these tall stems. And eventually by the time they go to seed, they're probably two, in, two feet tall or so. And then there are new leaves that wrap around the, um, that wrap around the, the flower stems so that as your, as your flower stems are starting to fade, these new leaves unfurl and they're bright green early and then they fade to more of a medium green. And then uh, again, as I said, as cold weather comes, they turn burgundy. Swamp pink is a, is a federally threatened plant. It's a rare plant in nature. It grows in sort of pine bearing conditions along the East Coast. It's not something that you're gonna run across very often and it should be left alone if you do find it. Uh, never, never collect it from the wild. Buy, if you're gonna buy plants, buy them from reputable nurseries that are growing nursery-grown stock. And it, it thrives in places like, the, the perfect place for it is in damp to wet soil on the edge of a pond or a stream or something like that. It likes wet soil. It doesn't like to be submerged in water, but it likes soil that's really mucky in the spring, the way that plants like skunk cabbages will grow. And, uh, and certainly like as much sun as you can provide for it, full sun to a half day sun, and, uh, and it will grow and thrive. And eventually it will multiply each, 
stem will put off a couple of offsets. So with patience and time, Swamp Pink can grow into uh, patches and produce quite a show for you this time of the year. So I hope that gave you a few ideas of things to try, some of my favorites, although the list is long, of favorites, uh, slightly unusual or different spring perennials, spring wildflowers and spring perennials to bring color and interest to your garden. Thank you. So Danielle, I should, I should point out that Prunus and uh, the apple genus Malus are both in the family Rosaceae. So they are both in the same family. I was correct. And, oh, I, I, well, and sorry. Ni- ni- neither one are thermogenic, however. <laughs> well, then they're still not as cool as skunk cabbage.